Jesus is coming again. Marvelous message. And the disciples are up in the upper room. And uh, they're up in the upper room because uh, <laughs> they're afraid. They're wondering what's going to happen now that the soldiers had taken the body of Jesus and sealed it. And uh, that seal was not to be broken by anybody under penalty of death. And yet here it was. And the stone was removed. And uh, here it was eight days after. John chapter 20, verse number 26. It says, And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. I, I don't know if you enjoy peace. You know, if you're concerned about what's on CNN or Fox News, you probably don't have much peace in your heart. If you have a large bank account or an IRA, you're probably concerned about those things. And, you know, if, if there's uh, situations in the world, the war in Ukraine and 
now the uniting of Russia and China together uh, against the United States. They've always been against the United States. If you're looking for salvation in the United States of America, you're looking in the wrong place. God has allowed this nation to be what, well, I don't want to say to be what it's become, but God doesn't often stop you when he's already given you his word. It, it, it's, he has allowed us to be established for just a, several hundred years. I don't even think it's that much. What is it? I don't know how long it's been, been, a, been the nation. It's just the fact that it remains is that it's by God's grace that we live in this country. Amen. But very few people appreciate it. As very few people appreciate the gospel of Jesus Christ. They do not appreciate what this country stood for. They don't appreciate what this country, uh, what most of this country wants to get back to. But they keep on pushing and pushing and pushing. And this is exactly what happened during the ministry of Jesus Christ. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, those who hated him, pushed against him and against him, I guess, until he, they finally killed him. Well, they, they crucified him, but he didn't, he didn't stay dead. Now, this, this, this uh, same thing with the gospel of Jesus Christ and the church. The church has been persecuted from day one, and it's been hounded and, and harassed and uh, tried to be snuffed out, but yet it's going to abide forever. Amen. And those of us who trusted Jesus Christ as our, as our Savior, uh, who have in our hearts believed that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, Amen. that uh, we have been sealed by God's own power until the day of Jesus Christ. Well, he's going to sound that trumpet off and the voice of the archangel is going to tell everybody to come up hither. All those who love the Lord, all those who have been saved by His, uh, by faith in his precious blood uh, for the forgiveness of sins, they're going to rise up from the grave and, and 1 Thessalonians proves that out. 1 Corinthians 15 proves that out. Those should be chapters of the Bible that should be dear and near to your hearts. And they're going to rise up to be with the Lord. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Now, as we go through this morning's message here, uh, it's important that you understand uh, that God cannot lie. It's not that he won't lie. It's not that, you know, he might lie or might not lie. He, he cannot lie. He cannot deny himself. So he has presented himself as, as the God of truth. And we are to either accept that or reject it. So, so the people of this country, they can embrace the Constitution. They can embrace the Bill of Rights. They can embrace the Declaration of Independence. And they can get into, the, into a position where, once again, the churches could be filled. Once again, when uh, a revival sweeps a nation and the people turn back to God. And it's, a, it's, a, it's not something conjured up amongst the people, but a desire of God's people to bring the, 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 the church itself and, and therefore the nation itself uh, to a large degree uh, to a point of repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. And to be reestablished as a, as a country uh, that wants to, be, uh, wants to be not accepted by the rest of the world, but to be accepted and blessed by God. Amen. That's the only way that's ever going to happen. And it doesn't look good right now. The days are dark. And they're not going to get much brighter than what you see outside today. And we realize these things simply because that's what the Bible has told us. We're not making this stuff because that's how we prognosticate it, but this is how we see stuff. This is what the Word of God has to say. So when we come to you or we approach the Bible, we look at this. This is God's Word here written for Amen. us in our language so that we can learn from it, we can adapt to it, and have this peace. This peace. Jesus said, peace be unto you. Now they needed peace. They were, they were besides themselves. Their, their leader, their master, their Lord was crucified and buried. And, 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 and now there's talk that somehow he, he's not in the tomb anymore. He, he, who stole his body and, and where is he now? Well, here they are in that upper room. 
and the doors being shut, he stands there in the midst of them. He just comes in. His new body allowed him to do that. Then saith he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. Obviously, there were wounds there. Obviously, when you see Jesus Christ the next time, he's going to have scars in his hands and in his side. And that's how you're going to be able to determine who he is, other than he's coming as the great king of kings and lord of lords. And when we meet him in the air, he's going to be so bright and shiny and uh, so, so glittering, and it's just going to be an amazing thing. There's nothing on earth that could compare to that to explain these things to you. Uh, but Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. But that's after Jesus said, Don't be faithless, but believing. This is what God requires of all of us. All the people that are in this world, he gave his only begotten son, so whosoever thinketh about him, no. Whosoever hopeth about him, no. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Believe is the key word here. It's always been believe. In, the, in his discourse with Mary at, at, at the two, at the, before they went to the tomb of Lazarus, where he personally calls Lazarus out from the dead, and he comes out alive, only to die again, but at a later date. And he says to her, after he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And then he says to her, believest thou this? So it's not a matter of what denomination you adhere to. It's not a matter of what church you go to. It's a matter of whether you believe this book or not. It's going to determine your eternal destination. Jesus says in, in, in John chapter 5, uh, he, he's talking about, I believe it's John chapter 5, where someone, well, well maybe, uh, let, me, let me try to pick it up here because I don't want to mess it up. And I know it's in there. John chapter 5, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. There's coming an hour when the Son of God's voice is going to sound out. And the dead are going to hear his voice. But in reading this, the last phrase says, and they that hear shall live. Not everybody in the grave is going to hear. Not everybody who's been buried is going to hear. The ones who are going to hear are the ones who were saved. The ones who trusted Christ. The ones who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, was the ones who were obedient. The ones who, uh, by faith, believed God. Did the best they could. And now they're here in the grave. And they're going to come up because they're going to hear the voice of the Son of God. The ones who aren't hearing the voice of the Son of God today to get saved are not going to hear that voice. They're going to remain in the grave until after the thousand year reign of Christ. And then they're going to have to go to that white throne judgment where there's no escape. And be cast into the lake of fire. Where they will be, dwell eternally or as long as God lives. So the, this choice gets narrower and narrower and narrower. But it's a choice every individual has to make. All that are in the grave are going to rise up. And they're either going to go to the resurrection of life or the resurrection of damnation. So it's imperative. It's important. So you're trying to scare me? I didn't write that. But it's there. I don't, I don't agree with God's idea, but it's his idea. It's, it's what he says is going to happen. So it behooves you to hear the word of God because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, believing these things. So Thomas uh, 
uh, he reaches, he, he looks to the Lord, and he doesn't stick his hand in, in the Lord's side or in his handprints, uh, but he just falls on and says, my Lord and my God. Jesus says, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. That's what people's problems are. They got to see something. They want to see some evidence. You know, you, just because we go through the seasons here, it's not enough evidence for a lot of people. Just, just because some words in a book, it just doesn't seem to be enough evidence in there to convince people that this is really true. But the, even the birth of a child and to see how it all comes together and the, the miraculous uh, process uh, of, of uh, two people coming together and, and producing a, a likeness of themselves and populating the earth in great numbers. And it's just an amazing process to look uh, with an electronic microscope at the the cell of a human, single cell of a human being, and, and the complexity of the whole thing. And we, we just decide whether, will God challenge you? And he says, well, either believe it or leave it. He says, take it or leave it. He says, either reject it or believe it. One or the other, he says to us. He says, he lays all of this, this burden on ourselves to make a choice. A choice whether we want to live with him forever in a body like his or to suffer in a place of agony and shame with every other rejecter of Christ. You see, if, if, you, if you're intelligent, you're questioning things right now. You're, you're, you're saying, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I don't know why it's got to be that way. Well, I don't know why it's got to be that way either other than that's the way God's put it in his book. So you can shut yourself off from it all and just by chance see where you go. I mean, there's really no chance. It's already, it's already been laid out in here. Because it says here in the rest of these verses in John chapter 20, many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. That word believing, it comes again and again and again. The preaching of the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead is well known throughout the whole world. By this time, 2023, over 2,000 years since the Savior rose from the dead, it's well known throughout most of this world that uh, this, this one here, this, the account of the resurrection of Christ, in relation to the billions of souls living today, there are very few who truly believe the Bible account of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection for the salvation of their soul. Let alone the fact that the Son of God is alive forevermore, as he said he would be. But before Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, he was mercilessly brutalized, maligned, and marred more than any man. And then on top of that, he bare the sins of all humanity in his own body on the cross uh, so that anyone who will just believe on him will receive God's forgiveness uh, and uh, the glorious gift of eternal life. He laid down his life and uh, three days and three nights later, he took it up again and is seated at the right hand side of the heavenly father waiting to return for those who by faith have been saved by God's wonderful grace. Are you one of them? Well, praise the Lord that you are, if you truly are, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So God's word puts forth a question. He says, what must I do to be saved? And then the Bible answers straightforwardly, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Now, it's usually at that point where many well-meaning Christians uh, will be at someone's door, uh, concerned for the person's soul, will say, you know, after introducing themselves and giving them a gospel track, will say, uh, well, do you know if you're going to heaven when you die? And the person says, well, uh, I, I don't know if I will be. Some of the answers, they, they're really varied. But uh, in, in general, it's that. 
And, it, and so would you like to know? He says, oh, sure, I'd love to know that. And you say, well, you explain some quick uh, adaptation to the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And then he says, well, okay, would you, do you believe that? Yes, I believe that. And then he said, well, just pray this prayer with me. And then you never see them again. You walk away, it's all done. You, you, you feel good about yourself because you just saved the soul, right? Uh, so you think. And, uh, and you, you have nothing to do with salvation of a soul other than being a messenger. But then uh, you leave them with hardly any clear instructions what to do afterwards. You're going to pick them up and bring them to church? Uh, or, is your, or is your job all done? Or you just leave them squandering there? Listen, you need to spend time with people. The Philippian jailer was in a, a, a position where he was going to be put to death when the prisoners escaped. And, uh, and they, here was Paul and Silas locked up overnight, and they were going to go before the council the next day. And this great earthquake came as Paul and Silas were singing and praising God all night long. And, uh, and, and it says that he came into the, into the area where the prisoners were, and he says, Lord, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Now, if that's what you do in a door, and you say that, they need to get some understanding about that. Because what happens in Acts chapter 16, verse 32, that the jailer washed their uh, wounds and took them into the, his own house, and they fed them, and then spake unto him, they spake unto him the word of the Lord. More completely. They were able, able to sit down with him and his household and explain these things to them, just like we used to have the house uh, studies when we used to go to different people's homes and they would invite their family and their friends and we could sit together in a relaxed place and nobody's really uncomfortable and the questions get asked about, well, what does this mean? And, and how do you apply this in the Bible? Or uh, what, what should I do now? But they spoke unto him the word of the Lord more perfectly and, and to everybody that was in their house. So they didn't just get, say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, now we're out of here. They didn't do that at all. He said, I want to give you seven important biblical doctrines. And, and don't let the word doctrine uh, mess you up. It, it's, it's, a, it's a good word. It's, it's a Bible word. But these are, these are things we ought to know. So without this knowledge, Jesus simply becomes another savior, uh, a savior of convenience, uh, instead of the only savior, which he is. Jesus Christ, here's the first one, Jesus Christ is the eternal son of God. Mm -hmm. This is something they need to know. He wasn't the man Christ Jesus. He, was, he wasn't the lowly Galilean, though he had been those things. Now he is the risen savior. He is now going to become the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's going to establish his rule in Jerusalem. Do they need to know all that? No. They need to know he is the only begotten Son of God. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. All the same was in the beginning with God. He came into his own, but his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. It says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Yeah, that's, that's, you, you could easily point to somebody saying, that's what Christmas is supposed to be all about. You know, the, the manger scene and, and, and the wise men and all that story and all those things there. That's, that's what when Christ was born of the Virgin Mary. And, and that's another thing. The second thing is that they need to know Jesus Christ was virgin born. A lot of people said, it's not just the carpenter's son. Well, he, he was like the adopted son. He was the parent with the responsibility along with Mary to watch over young Jesus as he was growing into teenagehood and, and uh, manhood. But Isaiah in the Old Testament says this prophetic word. He says, therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And then in Matthew chapter 1, we see that Mary was a spouse to Joseph and she was with child. And Joseph said, I, I, I can't do this. I, I, I got to put her away. I can't be married. Somebody who's already been with another man. And so he, he was... He was Truly thinking correctly, but then the angel of the Lord had to appear to him in a dream and said, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. 
Okay, there's a lot of people who believe in the virgin birth. And the, that's one of the main doctrines of the church. But why? <laughs> they need to know why. Because if you don't give them the why, they're going to exalt Mary above Christ. They're going to exalt Mary and put her on the same level as God. I say, why do I say it? Because that's what they do. Right. Jesus is not uh, nailed to a cross anymore. Why are there statues like that? Well, they're reminded. What do you mean remind you? You don't need to be reminded of that. And, and then, you know, Mary's got, he's got Jesus all, you know, just laying in her lap. That wasn't how that was. So what they do is they misconstrue what the Bible says when it says they shall call you blessed. And they elevate her to a position of worship. And that's wrong. That is so, so wrong in God's eyes. There's only one Savior, and he doesn't need help. He's a mediator, and he doesn't need a mediator race. And you all, you look at these things, it says, that which was conceived of the Holy Ghost. Oh, well, well, why? Because they had to break the sin line. That sin was passed down to you from your parents and their parents, from their parents and their parents. And, and if you have children, you're going to pass it on to them because it's in you too. This is why there's funerals. This is why there's cemeteries. This is why there's graveyards and hospitals. Because we die. The body, God does not save the body. He saves the soul. He just puts the body on hold. It goes back to the dust. But one of these days, those who are in the grave are going to hear his voice. And those that will hear are going to be the saved ones. And they will rise up to meet the Lord in the air. And then you and I who are saved, you and I who have our heart, we believe. You say, well, how, how, how do you get saved? You believe in here, in your heart, that God has raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And it's got to go from here down into here. Hearing of the word of God is important. It gives you faith to believe in your heart. And so in your heart you believe. I have no doubt that that's actually what took place. I wasn't even there. So you look at, you know, and say, well, how could that be? Well, do you really believe George Washington is the father of this country? I, I'm not going to tell you otherwise because I don't know. I wasn't there. I don't, I'm reading history books. You, do, you, do you get that? Was there really somebody on the moon? I don't know if there was somebody up on the moon. And we're just look at pictures and we see things and read things that, that come to our senses. And we either believe it or we reject it. You know, that's how people approach the Bible. They, they don't have the faith to believe that this is truly the word of God and it affects them. So he says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Jesus Christ was different than any other person born of a woman. He did not receive a sinner's nature because he was not conceived by Joseph, but by the Holy Ghost, and in whom there is no sin. That would make him the perfect sacrifice. And he became that for you so that you would not have to die and, and, and go to hell. Thirdly, Jesus was crucified for sinners. Well, why was he crucified for sinners? I say, well, I believe Jesus died on the cross. Okay, but do you know why he died on the cross? You see, people just, they just see these things and they say, well, that, these are things I believe. But what's the foundational truth underneath your belief? Got to be something there. Or it's sinking sand. You need to be on a solid, firm foundation. It's got to be the word of God. There's nothing else that's got that strength to it. Everything else will fail. So, Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, that puts us all in the same boat. Every one of us. I could look at you and I could confess every sin I ever committed that I can recall. And you might faint, you might, you know, run, I don't know what you might do. You might say, gee, yeah, I'm not as bad as you, you know, I don't know. But, but we can relate these things to each other. We don't, we don't have to. You don't come to me and tell me, Father Ed, I have to confess that I did such and such and such and like that. 
I said, well, you, you ought to know what I did. Yeah. Uh, no, we don't do that. We confess our sins unto the Lord. We confess our sins unto God, and he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, how's he do that? By his own power. I don't know. He just does it, and that's what I believe in. So Romans 5, 6 says, when we were yet without strength, you strong enough to save yourself? You strong enough to withstand the fires of hell? You strong enough to stand before God and not fall down? Are you, do you have that kind of a strength? When we were yet without strength, the strength of the law is sin. That's the result. It's death. Because no one can keep the law. Brother Frank brought up a question this morning. He says, is anybody able to keep the law? Well, there was a braggart one time in the Bible. And he, and, and he said, what, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, well, you know, keep the commandments, love God with all your heart, you know, don't steal, don't kill. And he says, I've done all these things for my youth. I mean, he was bragging about it. But is there any other thing I should do? Yeah, sell everything you had, give it to the poor and follow me. And that's where it fell apart. Wouldn't do it. What good thing must I do to inherit eternal life was the question. Well, the only good thing you do is to, is to obey God. You can't do enough good to earn salvation. You can't do enough good to make God smile at you if you're not saved. If you're saved, that's when your good deeds count. There's where you'll get some rewards from that. You know, on earth, if you're doing just doing things just to be nice without God as your Savior, without the Lord Jesus Christ as your, as your Savior, uh, you're going to get a good feeling about that. Because a lot of people, they like to do things for people and not get anything back from it because it just it makes them feel good. And it's a great feeling if you've ever done it, and you probably have. But it, it is a real nice feeling in your heart to know that you helped someone who couldn't pay you back. It's a blessing. It, it truly is. Helping someone in need. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But you better not be counting on that to get you through heaven's gate because it happens. That road is so narrow. That road is so straight that you have to follow Jesus through it. And there's no getting around it. There's no side path. There's no, there's no off the beaten path with that. It's a straight and narrow way. And so Christ died for us when we were without strength. He, would, he justified us with his blood and we'll be saved from wrath through him. Why would they add that in there? Why would they say this in Romans chapter 5, verse 9? Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. What wrath? What wrath is he talking about? For if when we were enemies, what do you mean enemies? Yeah, we were enemies against God. I mean, that cute little kid running around there, you know, having fun with the neighborhood kids and just, you know, just enjoying life. And he, he kneels in, in his prayers and says, now I lay me down to sleep and... That, and then grows up to be a teenager, a respectable citizen, uh, and, but he doesn't know Christ as a savior. She doesn't know Christ as her savior. God is not willing that any should perish. He has done everything he can do. What can he do more? And, and, and not uh, deny himself. No, he, could. he can't do anything more for you. Jesus Christ was the ultimate. If you bypass Jesus Christ, you bypass eternal life, you bypass forgiveness of sins, you bypass a glorious future. But there's no, you know, you can do things in this world and climb the ladder of success and you can uh, depend on how you feel, but it's all going to come to an end one day. Without Christ as your Savior, you're going to be lost. The Bible says, how shall we escape? Escape what? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken of the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? What do you mean escape? What do I have to escape? <laughs> you have to escape the wrath of God. Well, why is God angry about this stuff? If you did what God did for the salvation of souls, and he was accepted by a few, but rejected by the many. What would you do with the many? 
So that's okay. You come on in. Everybody gets a blue ribbon. Everybody gets a prize. Just, just come. You know, just come. He does say come, but he says come the way I tell you to come. And religion won't do it for you. Being a member of Bethel Baptist Church won't do it for you. Owning a Bible won't do it for you. You have to believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And without that, you're lost. You're without God. You're without hope. I don't care how many hymns you sing, how many prayers you pray. You're without God. You're without hope. You need Jesus Christ. He doesn't need you, but he loves you. He'll use you if you allow him to. But I will tell you, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Unsaved. So he was crucified for us, and he reconciled us to God. But most importantly, he arose bodily from the dead. Now, Christianity stands or falls on this one doctrine here that Jesus Christ is alive, that he's alive forevermore, that he's seated at the right hand of the Father. Without that, Christianity in itself would fall. Well, I don't know about them. There's still probably be a lot. This church would have to fold up. Because this is what we stand on. If, if it were a lie that he did not write about it, the Jehovah Witnesses will, will just harass you to tell you that Jesus didn't rise bodily. He rose as a spirit. Well, then why did he tell Thomas to handle me and see? Why? Well, stick your hand in my side. Well, where is it? I don't know. Where is it? I don't see where it is. My hands, Thomas. My hands are right in front of your eyes. I don't see anything. And that's how people act. They act like they don't see any truth in this book. And so that's going to be their downfall. And yet there's hope. There is so much hope. There is so much uh, joyfulness. There is so much pleasure. There's so much, so much to uh, receive from God by putting your faith and trust in this one whom we call Jesus Christ. Amen. He arose from the dead. Now many deny that there is a resurrection, believers included. What do, you, what do you mean? I'm telling you. If Paul writes to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 15. He's writing to the believers. He's not writing to the people out, on the, uh, out there in the public. He's writing to the believers. He says, now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you, believers, that there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen... Everything I just said this morning, you might as well throw it in the trash can if he isn't alive. He says, our preaching is vain and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. If I'm a false witness of God, you know what you need to do with me? You need me to run out, run out of this place and never let me back in here. These three men who handle the word of God to teach you the truth of the Bible. Get them out of here. Throw them out of here if this isn't so. We would be false witnesses. And if Christ be not raised, our faith is vain. We're yet in our sins. And all those who died that we love, our, uh, my mother, my father, my sister, right? Uh, the, these people here that uh, have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and now they're in the grave waiting to hear the voice now. They're, they're perished forever. There is no resurrection. If there's no resurrection, and many people, even believers, say there's no resurrection. And if we have only hope in this life, we're of all men most miserable. Why would we even bother coming to church? You got some reason to come here other than the hope that's within you? That glorious hope of the appearing of Jesus Christ, isn't that what compels you to come to church? I, if you're saved, you, you know you're saved. You know you're going to be uh, with God after you draw your last breath. What brings you here? Is, you know, just some friendships? Or is it just, yeah. now you're going to start thinking, yeah, why do I come here? <laughs> you can't. <laughs> Someone else. Ah, uh, but you're getting the rep. You're getting the reputation. <laughs> if I smear chocolate all over my face, will you pay more attention? <laughs> if Christ be not risen from the dead, then you could be your own savior. Don't try to be your own Savior. And Jesus' blood is the only substance that can cleanse him from sin. A 
Bible declares that all mankind are sinners, and people believe there are many ways to clean their sins away, and just as many ways for them to get into heaven. But Isaiah 59 reminds us, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Christians are the same way. You know, Christians, you do something against God's will, he's not going to hear your prayer. They say, well, I, Jesus said, ask you what you will. Yeah, but he said, there's, there's some prerequisites to that, doing the things that are pleasing in the sight. And so you have to understand that these things go hand in hand. How, how, how can I have my sins washed away? From baptism? There's water. There's no cleansing agent in that. Well, wishing them away? Is that, how about if I just take my life, that all my sins will be going away? No, no. You, you'll be put in the ground, and one day you'll be re resurrected again to stand before the uh, great white throne judgment. What about keeping the commandments? Will that work? No. Doing more good things than bad things? No. You keep in count? No, that doesn't work. How about joining a church? How about confessing to a priest? How about taking a hot silly bath? How can you cleanse yourself of these sins? The psalmist says, though I wash my hands with niter, <laughs> yet still I'm unclean. <laughs> 1 John 1, 5, this is the message that we have heard of him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins to God, who already knows us, who already knows what we've done, he just wants us to owe up to it. And he's the only Savior of the soul. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. Amen. Jesus said you must be born again. He didn't leave it up as a question mark. He put a period at the end of that statement. You must be born again. Amen. How do I get born again? You got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart. That's going to change you. It's going to change your life. You'll be a, a different person. The things that you do, you're going to always be reminded by the Holy Spirit of God who will be implanted in you what you believe that to do the right thing to do the important thing to do the thing with other people in consideration that's how you live and you fight that new life you fight that new way of living and thinking you're going to be miserable you will until you submit you submit yourself to the Lord you submit yourself to his will and you're going to find out things are going to be different for you and those who live with you, and those who are members of this body of Christ right here. It will happen. It should happen. Because it can happen. But it's on us to allow it to happen. It comes first from believing. Finally, Jesus is going to come back for his church. I hope you're ready for that. The dead in Christ are going to rise first, according to 1 Thessalonians. Chapter number four. And then those of us which were alive remain shall be caught up together with the Lord here, so shall we ever be with the Lord. And there's a lot of blessings. Next week I'm going to preach on the results of the resurrection. And see what is really God has blessed us with and given us. It's a whole, it's a whole, a wonderful crate. It's almost like the golden ark. You open it up and all the blessings are inside there. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we give you thanks for loving us to that degree that you loved us. Father, so much about you that we haven't really understood. And yet these things that are written here are given for us that we might believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and have life through his name. I pray, Father, with all my heart, the more I preach this, the more I believe it. The more I study it, the more I understand it. The more I look at it, the more I agree with it, Father. I thank you for that, increasing our faith through the preaching of the Holy Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen.
All right, let's take our hymnal one more time and we'll sing 244 and we'll be dismissed. We want to keep you overly late this morning. Not for some cooks, brother. <laughs>